الرحيم وصلى الله على محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين سبحانك لا علم لنا الا ما علمتنا انك انت العليم الحكيم ولا حول ولا قوه الا بالله العلي العظيم السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته ان شاء الله تعالى everyone is uh, doing well <coughs> everyone is staying safe um, and everyone is um, in good spirits inshallah ta'ala so we're continuing our series on the kitab shifa by qadi iyad so um we are on section five here this is still part one uh chapter two um section five and if people have comments or questions you can certainly type them in into the live chat inshallah and i will try to answer them as they come in um uh or uh answer them next week if they require a bit of uh, research so this section in in my translation this is on page 39 um Iyad, he calls it his eloquence in sound arabic so he says the Prophet Sallallahu preeminence in eloquence and fluency of speech is well known. He was fluent, he was skillful in debate, um, and this is um, from the, um, the uh, necessary attributes of all prophets is that they should have uh, acumen, sagaciousness, um, they should be extremely intelligent, especially in matters of religion, Skillful in debate, very concise, clear, uh, clear in expression, lucid, he used sound meanings, and was free from affectation. Affectation is the word she uses uh, to translate. This means pretension. Um, so someone who uses affectation or someone who is pretentious in speech is someone who uses speech which is intended to like impress people. Right, um, and it has sort of a artificial uh, quality to it, and so the Prophet Sallallahu speech is totally free of this type of pretension. That his eloquence was very, very natural. And this is simply how he spoke. Um, there was no pretension behind anything he was saying. He was given mastery of language. He says literally all the words and was distinguished by producing marvelous maxims. These are wise sayings, like aphorisms, hikam. He goes on to say, he learned the dialects of the Arabs and would speak to each of their communities in their own dialect and converse with them in their own idiom. So this not only demonstrates the incredible wisdom uh, and, and intellect of the Prophet Wasallam. Uh, but also demonstrates that he had incredible respect for others, right? Uh, that when he would speak to a certain Arab tribe <clears throat> uh, that was not Qureshi, uh, he would use their dialect as a way of honoring them and use idiomatic language uh, that they were familiar with in order to communicate to them um, sound meanings uh, of, of the Qur'an and of his message and this is also part of the wisdom of da'wah that you speak as it were the language uh, of the people that you're inviting to the truth and some of the ulama are better at this than others um, some of the ulama uh, are better at written exposition than actually giving lectures uh, but a true scholar knows how to tailor the message to the given audience um, uh, so, uh, there are scholars in our community that can give an incredibly effective lecture to a group of five-year-olds in kindergarten, and, and then that same scholar could go to, um, a, a school of law at a university and give an equally effective message to law school students and everything in between. That's part of the wisdom of giving da'wah. 
So the Prophet وسلم, not only and, and, and the Prophet وسلم, when before he made the Hijrah, we know that he sent before him uh, some Sahaba to um, bring him back information as to the um, the temperaments and the and the likes and dislikes and the character and attitudes of the people of of, of, of Yathrib. And so Musa ibn Umar he went to Yathrib before the Hijrah. And he would teach them Quran, and he would get to know the people there, and he would come and report uh, back to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam re, um, uh, uh, received him, and actually came, or came came into Medina to Munawwara, he would tailor the message for those specific groups. And again, that's part of the wisdom of Dawah, and that's part of his incredible intelligence, and that's him fulfilling uh, his obligation because another one of the Wajibat of a prophet, another um, obligatory attribute <clears throat> of a prophet is tabliq. They must convey the message, and the prophets they convey the message in the best of forms. So he continues, Qadi Iyad, <clears throat> he says, he answered their arguments using their own style of rhetoric, so that more than once a large number of companions had to ask him to explain what he had said. So his companions, if you look in the Meccan period, obviously, they're Qurayshi, so they speak a certain dialect of Arabic. Uh, but then people would come into to Mecca, or when he was in Medina, you have different groups of people speaking different dialects of Arabic, uh, either in Medina or passing through a Medina, and you would speak to them in their language. And so the Qurayshi Sahaba, who, who, who weren't familiar with those dialects, they would ask him, what did you mean by that? What does that mean? And the Prophet would explain to them what he had said. Whoever studies his hadith and biography will know that and verify that, he says. The way he spoke to the Quraysh, the Ansar, and the people of the Hijaz and the Najd was not the same as the way he spoke to, and then he mentions, Dhul Mish'ar al-Hamdani, Tihfa al-Handi, Qatan ibn Haditha al-Ulaymi, al-Ash'ath ibn Qais, Wa'il ibn Hujr al-Kindi, and others from among the chiefs of Hadramaut. Hadramaut is... <clears throat> In the uh, in, in in Yemen, it's it's the desert in Yemen, uh, south of the Arabian Peninsula, and and the kings of Yemen. He says here, and then Qadi Iyad here he goes on to partially quote uh, some of the letters of the Prophet وسلم, the correspondences that he he wrote or had dictated to the various tribes and kings. And it really doesn't come across, the Arabic doesn't quite uh, come across here because it's obviously an English, English translation, but uh, it's an interesting section. We're not going to go into it too much. We do want to look at some of the hadith, however. So he continues to say, Qadi Iyad, he says, and his point about all of this is that the Prophet وسلم, he used the vocabulary of these particular people as well as their stylistic metaphors and common expressions employing this language with them so that they could make what they had revealed uh, for them clear, so that he could make what had been revealed for them clear to the people, and in order to speak to the people in a way that they would recognize. So this goes back to the, the ayah that we quoted in past classes, Surah Al-Nahal, uh, Surah number 16, verse 144, Indeed, we sent down upon you a dhikr, the reminder, the Qur'an, لِتُبَيِّنَ linnas مَا نُزِّلَ إِلَيْهِمْ In order for you to make bayan, in order for you to clarify and explain to the people what has been revealed to them. Right? Um, so, it is part and parcel of the vocation of the Prophet wasallam to make bayan, to make clear, to explain the message uh, of the Qur'an to the people. And of course, there's a famous hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu that is well known, where he said, I was given Jawami ul kalim wa Jawahir ul hikam I was given uh, incredibly comprehensive and eloquent speech um, containing uh, uh, jewels of wisdom. Right? So one of his companions actually described him and he said that the Prophet ﷺ, he rarely spoke, but when he did speak, 
um, he spoke the truth. So the prophet was more tassy turned in speech. He, he, he didn't speak much. But when he did speak, it was very powerful. It was very comprehensive. It was very wise. And we'll give a few examples of that actually from the hadith, um, inshallah. So Qadi Iyadi continues, he says, in the hadith, when Al-Amri asked for something, the Prophet used the dialect of Bani Amr. That's just another example he gives of how the Prophet would use the dialect of the tribe that he was speaking to and their idiomatic expressions as a way of honoring that tribe in a way of facilitating their faham, their, uh, their understanding of the Risala and of the Quran. As for his everyday speech, famous oratory and his uh, famous oratory and his comprehensive statements and maxims, which have been related, people have written volumes about them, says Khadi Iyad, and books have been compiled containing their words and meanings. <clears throat> his speech comprises unequaled eloquence and in incomparable fluency. This is this this is shown by such expressions. Now he gives a list of many many ahadith here. Um, and uh, to demonstrate what he calls this this unequaled eloquence and incomparable fluency of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We'll look at a few of these hadith and then we'll add a few uh, as well, inshallah. So one of the hadith that he quotes here is translated here by, by Aisha Buli as a man is with the one he loves, right? A man is with the one he loves, or a person is with the one that he or she loves. We'll say man because we're going to use it just as a default to include the female gender uh, as well. Uh, this hadith is a famous hadith is in Bukhari. Al maru ma'aman ahab. Al maru ma'aman ahab. So look at this hadith. It's very eloquent. You know, it just kind of rolls off the tongue. Al maru ma'aman ahab. Very eloquent. It's also a very iconic statement. It's very iconic. It's very famous, right? Uh, you hear it once, uh, and you tend to remember it. So it's also easy to remember. Um, it's also it communicates uh, uh, an incredible hope, uh, um, and is very optimistic, right? It's also very beautiful, and in fact, the Sahaba <clears throat> were overjoyed. When they heard these words from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, in the context of the hadith, um, the Bedouin who came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and uh, said, what must I do to become a Muslim? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told him about the five uh, arkan, the pillars, bunyal islamu ala khams, right? And Islam is built upon five, the shahada and the prayer and the zakat and the hajj and the fasting. And then uh, he said, that's all I'm going to do. That's it. I'm just going to do the bare minimum. Um, and then he said, but I love Allah and his messenger. And the Prophet said, right, a person will be, will be with the one whom he loves. And obviously, the, the Sahaba were overjoyed because they love the Prophet وسلم, without question. Um, so it was a, a day of, of, of great rejoicing for them. And by the way, if a hadith, according to the Mahadithin, the scholars of hadith, if a hadith has a grammatical error or a grammatical weakness, then the entire hadith is considered to be weak. If there's, a, there's going to be some weakness uh, in the hadith um, because it is, uh, it is well known that the Prophet wasallam. Uh, did not speak incorrectly, and that he used the most eloquent uh, and powerful forms of speech um, to communicate the message of the Quran and the message of uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, another hadith I wanted to, he doesn't mention it here, but it's a very, very powerful hadith. Um, it's in Bukhari and Muslim, Muttafaqun Ali, means it's in the, the two best books of hadith, the most authentic authentic books of Imam al-Bukhari, Imam al-Muslim, where the Prophet وسلم, he said, Yassiru wa la tu'assiru wa bashiru wa la tanafiru, or kama qala alayhi salatu wa salam. There's a beautiful hadith. Uh, in fact, um, Yoram Van Cleveren, who um, 
was a former anti-Muslim uh, Dutch politician uh, whom I just uh, heard speak um, at the Zaytuna College fundraising dinner, has an incredible story. He converted to Islam, um, and now he's uh, touring the world, as it were, and telling people his incredible story. It's really incredible, by the way. Uh, he wrote a book, too, recently called Apostate, um, uh, which is uh, uh, about his journey from Christianity to Islam. And it's a very interesting book, um, and I highly recommend it. Uh, but he actually said during that lecture, he said that this hadith, the, the hadith I just quoted, uh, had a profound effect on him. Yassiru wa la tu'assiru wa bashiru wa la tunafiru. And he actually quoted it in, in Arabic. And he did a pretty good job. He's a very smart man, mashallah. Um, so the meaning of the hadith, some of the meanings may suggest the following, make things easy for people, facilitate things for people, and don't make them difficult. Uh, and give people glad tidings, and don't scare them away. Right? It's a beautiful hadith. It's incredibly eloquent. And it displays something called antithetic parallelism uh, in its meaning. So that is to say that this hadith has a very strong rhetorical composition. It is very beautifully grammatically balanced, right? Um, and, you know, it's, uh, I, I highly recommend people to study, all, all Muslims, all believers, to study some Arabic. You know, it's difficult, but. Um, it's very rewarding, even if it's once a week or something, just to sort of, you know, get, get some, something of the meanings of these, of these words of the hadith, of the Quran, obviously. So what we have here is a form two imperative, yassiru, followed by a prohibition also in form two. And then again, we have a form two imperative, wabashiru wa latunafiru, followed again by a form two prohibition. So the statement is very balanced. Uh, grammatically, um, and antithetic parallelism. Parallelism means that 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 that, that the hadith uh, has um, uh, opposite meanings uh, to give it further balance. You know, to make things easy, don't make them difficult. Those are antonyms or antithetic. Um, give people glad tidings and don't scare them away. There's an antithetic relationship there as well. So you have you have multiple layers of symmetry uh, just with this one statement. It's an incredible statement. Um, it's also easy to remember, and it's also full of hope. It gives people hope. In the context of this hadith is when the Prophet وسلم, he sent, I believe it was Mu'adh ibn Jabal, if I'm not mistaken, somebody can correct me. When he sent him to Yemen, he gave him these, these, these instructions. You judge people by the Quran. What if I don't find it? Then by my Sunnah. Then what? Use your intellect, and then yassiru wa la tu'assiru wa bashiru wa la tunafiru. Beautiful hadith, just unequaled eloquence. Another hadith that struck me uh, very personally um, when I began to uh, practice the faith many many years ago is a hadith in Musnad Ahmad. Um, this is uh, a famous hadith. It's called Hadith al Rahma. Al Rahimun Yarhamukum al Rahman. Irhamu man fil ard, Yarhamukum or Yarhamukum man fil sama. Uh, that uh, the most compassionate shows compassion to those who show compassion. Show compassion to those on earth <coughs> and the one in heaven, as it were, in no anthropomorphic way, and the one in heaven will show you compassion. It's a very, very beautiful hadith. We notice that there's a lot of repetition in this hadith. And this is another strong rhetorical device in Semitic rhetoric, right? It's, it's you know, the initial audience of the Quran and of the Risala of Islam, the initial audience, the flag bearers are Arabs. And so, and, and these are Arabs that are, that are uh, extremely gifted with Arabic, with language. 
right? And they took pride in their poetry. And there's a surah in the Quran called Ashu'ara, the poets. And the poets were, they were loved and they were feared. Uh, so um, the Quran message and the message of the Prophet Wasallam in the first instance is tailored uh, for the Arab in order for the Arab to believe in the message and then take the message to the rest of the world. Obviously, the message of Islam is for everyone, but it's, it's the initial audience are Arabs. And repetition, as we said, is a very, very strong rhetorical device in Semitic, not just Arabic, in Semitic rhetoric. So like in Hebrew, for example, you have a lot of repetition if you read the Psalms um, or um, if you read um, the book of Proverbs, which these books are written in Arabic, uh, sorry, in Hebrew. Uh, Aramaic is another Semitic language. Um, uh, also, um, the uh, Akkadian language, uh, the, the Epic of Gilgamesh. You know, some of my students will read this text. It's a long poem in Akkadian, written in ancient Babylon. And you, you find a lot of repetition because the audience are Semites. Um, and then what else do we notice about this beautiful hadith? Well, the prophet changed the, the standard syntax so that the final word of the first jumla or, or, or sentence is ar-Rahman, right? Um, and, and the conceptual direct object is the first word of the sentence, which is in the nominative rather than in the accusative. I don't know if that makes sense uh, to y'all, but it's, it's a very interesting way. Uh, right? Yarhamuhumur Rahman. There's been, there's been sort of, there's an unconventional syntax here, uh, which makes the statement sort of pop out and, uh, and, take, and, and have people take notice uh, of it. It's very eloquently constructed. <clears throat> it's also a beautifully synonymic and antithetic as well in its parallelism. So we have irhamu, the second statement, irhamu man fil ar. Irhamu is a, an imperative in the plural, show compassion to those on earth. Yarhamkum, yarhamukum or yarhamkum, yarhamkum if it's a sukun, and it's from, it's from the same verb as irhamu, uh, but it's a different mood um, of the verb. It's an adjussive, right? And it has this sense of purpose. Uh, show compassion to those on earth so that um, the one in heaven, as it were, the word heaven, sama, is, is, is uh, in juxtaposition to all of the earth. So you have that antithetic parallelism. And then yarham and irhamu, these are juxtaposed. It's the same verb, um, but a different uh, person and mood. So again, the statement here is very deep structurally. It's, it's, it's very beautifully composed. It's not poetry. The Prophet wasallam is not a poet. He's not a sha'ir, right? He has no training in poetry. None of his statements, nor the Quran, is considered technically to be poetry. Um, the Arabs were very familiar, as I said, with poetry, and they had 16 Bihar, they had 16 uh, um, uh, ozan, or they had 16 meters of rhymed poetry, and the Quran does not fall into any of those categories, nor the hadith, right? Um, the Quran is in, uh, is in a league uh, all its own. Um, does not have, it's, it's, a, it's a sui generis, it's, it's, in a, it's, in a, it's in a category all its own. It's not poetry. But is very very poetic, but not technically shir. It's not poetry. Um, another hadith that he quotes here actually is on page forty-one. The translation is: "Injustice will appear as darkness <clears throat> on the day of rising. Injustice will appear as darkness <clears throat> on the day of rising." In this, in the Arabic, "Azulmu zulumat." Yom al -tiyama. So this is a very beautiful play on words, a beautiful 
what's known as alliteration, right? Um, the, the word zulm in Arabic means oppression, but zulma means darkness. It's from the same root, um, but has different meanings. Zulmu zulumat, yomul qiyamah. So oppression or injustice will appear as darknesses, it's in the plural, on the day of rising. And this hadith is in Muslim. Again, very, very eloquent, uh, very um, memorable, very easy to remember. Oh, another one I wanted to mention, and this is not mentioned by Fadi Iyad, but it is a dua that we shall have memorized. It is definitely a dua that you should have memorized, and especially uh, during Ramadan, which is coming up, inshallah. Um, this is a, a dua of the Prophet that he would um, recite uh, during the last odd uh, nights of the last third of the month of Ramadan. Allahumma inna ka'afun juhibu la'afwa fa'afu anni. And this uh, is recorded in the hadith of Imam at tirmidhi So if you look at this hadith, again you have alliteration. It's, it's, it, it's a beautiful and seamless alteration of parts of speech. Allahumma inna ka'afun. Afun is an active participle. Juhibu la'afwa. You love, uh, so the tr by the way, the translation is, Oh Allah, you are the effacer, the one who erases or effaces the sin. And you love to efface. Um, so efface from me my sins. That's the meaning of the hadith. So Allahumma inna ka'afun, that's an active participle. Tibbul afwa, that's an infinitive noun. Fa'afu uh, anni, and now we have a verb. Right? And we don't call this an imperative, even though it has the same morphology as an, as an imperative. The reason we don't call it a fi'l amr is because uh, one is speaking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? One is not giving a command to someone lower than oneself. One is, one is speaking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is called a fi'l talab. This is a, a verb of request, of, of respectful request. But we have that seamless alteration, active participle, you know, ism fa'il, then the mustar, then the fi'l, all from the same root, hence the alliteration. We also have uh, parataxis, what's, what's known in, in English rhetoric is parataxis, which is also very common in Semitic rhetoric. Parataxis is when two words or a clause of some sort, two sentences are juxtaposed without using a coordinating conjunction. <clears throat> uh, so, Allahumma inna ka'afuun tuhibbul afwa. Oh God, you are the effacer. You love effacing. Not therefore or and, then, thus, nothing like that. There's no coordinating conjunction. And the rhetorical effect of parataxis is that it makes the words again sort of pop out, uh, makes it more impactful. The last one I'll mention here <coughs> from the hadith, inshallah, is the hadith in Bukhari. It's a famous hadith where the Prophet ﷺ, he said, in fil jasadi mudqatan. Indeed, in the body, there is a lump of flesh. إِذَا صَلَحَتْ صَلَحَ الْجَسَدُ كُلُّ If it is sound then, or healthy, then the entire body is healthy. وَإِذَا فَسَدَتْ فَسَدَ الْجَسَدُ كُلُّ And if it is corrupt or unhealthy, then the entire, the entire body is unhealthy. أَلَا وَهِيَ الْقَلْبِ Indeed, it is the heart, the qalb. So here we have synonymic parallelism with mudra, right? And qalb, it's explaining what is the mudra, it is the qalb. You have antithetic parallelism with the verbs salahat and fasadat, healthy, unhealthy. You also have something called concentric composition, concentric composition, also known as the chiasm. In this short statement, it's like a big circle. It's really incredible. 
So the first line mirrors the fourth line. The fourth line explains the first line. What is the mudra? It is the heart. So these two lines uh, mirror each other, A and A prime. And then the second and third line, they also mirror each other. They have identical initial terms, ida, wa ida, and they have identical final terms, kulluhu, kulluhu. But they also have antithetical middle terms, uh, salahat and fasadat. Uh, so multiple level, levels of, 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 of rhetoric and composition and symmetry this statement is a is a nice circle circular composition called the chiasm in fact you have books written by non-muslim scholars of the quran um raymond farron um michelle kuypers and others uh, raymond farron in his book he says that the surah al-baqarah is one big chiasm Al-Baqarah, 286 verses. Um, and this in the center, usually a chiasm um, doesn't have to, but usually a chiasm will have a, a, a center, a focus. And he says that the center of Al-Baqarah is verses two, uh, 141 to 157, I believe. And right at the center of that center, you have, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطًا uh, the, that indeed that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made you a middle nation and that's actually verse 143 right in the middle of 286 of Baqarah the center of the chiasm according to Raymond Farron who's a professor at UC Berkeley or has his degree from PhD from Berkeley in your Eastern Studies but he wrote this incredible book on how Al-Baqarah is one big chiasm so if you think about this the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is not writing down the Quran when he's receiving these ayat. Um, and so, you know, how, how did he know where to put these different ayat to maintain this chiastic structure? You know, was he keeping all these ayat in his head and, you know, I have to put this here and there. What about, he's so he's doing that with Baqarah. He's also doing that with Al-Ma'idah. Michel Kuyper says that Ma'idah has an incredible rhetorical structure. He wrote an entire book on Al-Ma'idah. It's called The Banquet just on Surah Al-Ma'idah and how it's an in incredible ocean of symmetry. So he's doing that in his head and An-Nisa and Al-A'raf, all of these are just in his head and he's able to, he's, he's able to know where to put, you know, these ayat. And also with this, with this hadith about the heart, it's, it's a double entendre, right? So that the condition of the physical heart is generally a good indicator of overall health. I don't think any doctor would dispute that statement. A general indicator, if the heart is good, then overall health tends to be good, and vice versa. But also, also um, the condition of the spiritual heart, right? Uh, if it is healthy, then that's a good indicator that one's overall spirituality uh, is healthy as well. It's a very interesting study of these hadith, rhetorical analysis, Semitic rhetorical analysis of the statements of the Prophet <clears throat> And then he goes on to say that <clears throat> there's much more besides this that various groups of people have related about his words, conversations, speeches, supplications, <clears throat> comments, and contracts. There's no disagreement about the fact that in these things he occupied a station beyond compare. He obtained a preeminence in them which cannot be properly estimated. His unique sayings that no mouth had ever uttered before also have been compiled. No one can ever do them justice. His companion said to him, We do not find anyone more eloquent, more eloquent than you. He said, How could it be otherwise? The Quran was revealed on my tongue in a clear Arabic tongue. Another time he said, I am the most eloquent of the Arabs since I am from Quraysh and was brought up by the Bani Sa'd. So, um, uh, children who are raised in the, the desert um, they, because the Bedouin spoke the best Arabic, the most eloquent Arabic. So the Prophet 
not only has that incredible intellect, he has he has um, wahi descending upon him from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, but he was also raised among the Bani Sa'ad, among the Bedouin, uh, and so the first Arabic that he was hearing uh, was extremely eloquent. This gave him the strength and purity of the desert, along with the eloquence of the expressions of the city and beauty of his words. This was all combined with the divine support which accompanies revelation, which no mortal can comprehend. <clears throat> Remember the hadith we quoted the last class we had a few weeks ago, Umm um Ma'bad. Remember the Prophet said, Abu Bakr Siddiq, during the Hijrah, they stopped at a small village and this old woman was there and she met the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Umm Ma'bad, she said that the Prophet was sweet in speech, distinct, without using too few or too many words. It was as if his speech consisted of threaded pearls. He had a loud voice, which was very melodious, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So that is the uh, end of uh, section five. Um, looking forward, there's only three more classes uh, after this, and I do want to get to some of the rest of the chapter here. So I invite you to read sections uh, six through 11, but I'm going to go to section 12 now. This is <clears throat> on page 54. Section 12. So we're still in chapter 2, but it's section 12. And this is called His Forbearance, Long Suffering, and Pardon. So he begins by saying, Forbearance, Long Suffering, uh, Pardoning, in spite of having the power to punish, and patient endurance and affliction are distinct from each other. So he's going to define these terms. What is helm? What is forbearance? What what is ihtimal? What is long suffering? And what is sabr? What is afwa? What is patience and pardoning? So he says that forbearance or helm is is a state of dignified bearing and constancy despite provocation. Someone is being provoked, right? Um, and they and they they don't give in. They stay dignified. That's helm. Long suffering, ihtimal, is self restraint and resignation in the face of pains and injuries. So while one is suffering, sabr is similar to it, but its meaning is slightly different. He says, as for pardoning, it is refusing to hold something against uh, someone else. You know, sort of forgiving uh, and forgetting, as it were. And of course, that's related to the hadith we quoted. Allahumma inna ka'afoon. That, oh Allah, indeed you are the effacer. Right? So Allah is al-ghafir. And I mentioned this distinction in the past. Al-ghafir, the one who forgives. Al-ghaffar, really forgives. Al-ghafur, these are both, they all mean, all three of these terms mean forgiveness. The latter two are very emphatic. Ghafara has a meaning to cover something. But afwa has a meaning to to erase it completely, efface it, to take it out of existence. So he says, all of these qualities are part of the adab with, with which Allah endowed his prophet. He says, so Allah speaks to the prophet ﷺ in the Quran. He's going to quote Surah Al-A'raf, verse 199. So chapter 7, verse 199. Hold tight to pardoning. Hold tight, hold fast to forgiving and forgetting. Wa'amur bil uruf and command to the correct, command to the good. Wa'arid anil jahilin and turn away from the ignorant. Turn away from them. So you can imagine what kind of ignorance just average believers hear um, on a daily basis, whether it's in person or on TV or uh, on the internet. Um, and so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is telling the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, just ignore them, walk away from them, turn away from them. It is related that when this was revealed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he asked Jibril to interpret it for him. Jibril told him, wait until I ask the one who knows. He left and came back and said to him, O Muhammad, Allah commands you to unite yourself with those who cut you off. <clears throat> it's very difficult for people 
Right? Someone cuts you off, someone severs ties with you. Um, it's very difficult to be the better person because you think, well, if I do that, then I've, I've admitted I'm wrong or something, or uh, I'm going to be humiliated in, the, in that person's eyes, whatever it may be. So this is very, very difficult. Unite yourself with those who cut you off and give to those who refuse to give to you and pardon those who are unjust to you. So this is a very difficult thing to do. And this is why the, the character of the Prophet is magnanimous, is, is exalted. <clears throat> because these are, these are very difficult for people who have ego issues, almost impossible for people who have ego issues, people that um, uh, are self-aggrandizing, people who, um, who think of themselves more important than they really are, megalo me megalomaniacal people. Allah told him, Waspir alama asabak, be patient, be steadfast in the face of what afflicts you. Right? Waspir kama sabara ulul azmi min al rusul, in another ayah. These are quoted here by Qadi Iyad. Be steadfast as those of, re of, as, as those of resolution among the messengers are steadfast. Right? The messengers of Resolve ulul azm min al rusul. We mentioned those uh, earlier. These are the five great messengers of God, the great law bearing or law giving messengers of God. Uh, Nuh alayhi salam and Ibrahim alayhi salam, Musa alayhi salam and Isa alayhi salam, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam. That if you look at these five prophets, uh, they went through tremendous affliction and hardship uh, and they stayed they stayed patient and resolute um, I mean if you look at Ibrahim alayhi salam you know his his father um, although there's a difference of opinion as we said but uh, Azar uh, probably his paternal uncle uh, was an idolater he, his father biological father his walid probably died when he was very young didn't have a father Isa alayhi salam didn't have a father um, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created him in a miraculous fashion. Musa alayhi salam did not know his biological father. The Prophet sallallahu was an orphan, um, never met his father at all. His mother died when he was six years old. His grandfather died when he was eight. And that's just starting out life, you know. Um, and then you think about what happened during the lives of these prophets. Um, so, you know, we're reminded of the hadith that if Allah loves the people, he will try them, right? Um, and that the most severe of tribulations came to the prophets and those closest with them. Um, but those are prophets. So, so if something happens to a prophet, some sort of musiba, it's not because a prophet has, has, um, deliberately disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is inconceivable for a prophet to do that. Because the Prophet has isma, there's a type of divine protection, uh, prevention from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, so if there's some sort of musiba, it is to raise that Prophet in degrees and also for that Prophet to teach humanity how to react to such situations. But for non-Prophets, for you and I, uh, if these things happen in our lives, it could be a type of punishment. So what we have to do is a type of muhasaba or self-audit and try to determine why are these things happening? And we need to make adjustments uh, in our lives. So generally, if something like that happens to you, you should take it as a, a type of um, uh, punishment uh, and, and correct, rectify your behavior um, and have a good opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because that's a good thing. Punishment uh, is a way that, you, that he purifies us in, 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 a way to, in a way of provoking tawbah and changing our lives, right? So it's, it's a subtle type of mercy, actually, uh, when you think about it. Um, and then when it happens to other people, we shouldn't assume that they're being punished, right? That we should treat people... Um, with, um, you know, have a good opinion of people. 
and assume that uh, that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is is raising their degrees. Um, and if it is a punishment, then uh, have a good opinion that this person will uh, recognize what they're doing and they'll they'll make toba in in and uh, correct their behavior. <laughs> then he quotes here. He says he's quoting here the uh, part of the ayah twenty two of Surah Nur. Wal yafu, wal yasfahu. So. Pardon them, let them pardon, let them pardon, and let them overlook, right? So, waliyafu, in, in, in Arabic, this lam here is called lamu amr. So the verbs here are in the justice mood. So this has sort of the effect of a third-person imperative, right? That it's expected of us uh, to uh, pardon and overlook. And then Allah says, uh, do, do you not love that Allah would forgive you? Rahim. And Allah is forgiving, most forgiving, and and Rahim, merciful, compassionate, um, intimately loving. The one who is steadfast and forgives, that is part of the resolution of affairs. The results of this, and then Qadi Iyad, he says, the results of this of his forbearance and long suffering are quite evident. Every man with forbearance is known to have occasional lapses. The Prophet, however, was only increased in steadfastness, steadfastness when the injury to him was great, and was only increased in forbearance when faced with an excess of importunate people. So uh, he would become more and more patient with people the more they quote annoyed him exactly the opposite of of what you would expect with someone you know the hadith in Bukhari uh, when the man came and said Ausini, like advise me counsel me and the Prophet ﷺ said to him La taghdab, don't get angry and the man for whatever reason he said Ausini, counsel me and the Prophet said La taghdab. and then again Ausini, counsel me and the uh, and the uh, relator of the hadith Abu Huraira, he said, "Faradda niraran," that he would, he said this over and over and over again <laughs> to the Prophet sallallahu and he said very calmly, he would just respond, "La taqda, don't get angry." Aisha said, "This is in uh, Bukhari and Muslim Abu Dawood, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu was not given a choice between two matters, but that he chose the easier of the two, as long as it was not a wrong action. But if it was a wrong action, he would be the furthest of people from it. The Messenger of Allah did not take revenge for himself unless the honor, the hurma of Allah was violated. Then he would take revenge for the sake of Allah. Um, it is related that when the Prophet had his tooth broken and his face cut, on the day of Ghazwat Uhud, right? So uh, he had a ruptured lip, he, he chipped a tooth, he actually had a lacerated forehead, and there was, um, uh, he sustained a, a cut to his, his, his cheek here uh, because the chainmail had penetrated uh, his cheek and there was blood flowing, just basically flowing down his face. Um, he says it was practically unbearable for the companions. Uh, they said, if only you would invoke a curse against them. Right? He replied, I was not sent to curse, but I was sent as a summoner and a mercy. And then he made a famous statement, Allahumma hdi qawmi, fa'innahum la ya'lamun. Oh Allah, guide my people, for they don't know. Allahumma hdi qawmi. So, um, in the books of Sirah, it actually says that the Prophet was uh, catching the blood with his hands, uh, preventing the blood from striking the earth, and he was like absorbing the blood with his clothes. So the companion said, why are you doing that? And he said, if one drop of my blood should strike the earth, and then immediately uh, the wrath would descend upon the Quraysh, these people who are fighting against us. Uh, 
So for the Sahaba, that was a bit strange. I mean, we're fighting against them. Um, let the blood flow. And then they saw him a short time later with his hands raised, and they heard him say, Allah, and they thought, well, he, now he's going to curse them. And he said, Allahumma mahdi qawmi, Allahumma mahdi qawmi, fa'innahum la ya'lamu. Uh, oh God, guide my people, for they don't know. You know, there's something similar attributed to Isa alayhi salam in the Gospel of Luke. In Luke chapter 23, we're told that when Isa alayhi salam, <clears throat> according to the Gospel of Luke, when he was being crucified, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Um, and I've studied the New Testament uh, ex ex uh, extensively for years. I have a master's degree um, in New Testament. I did my PhD dissertation on the Gospel of John. So I'm very familiar with, with the textual history of the New Testament. And I'll tell you this, that that passage I just quoted from Luke, that's chapter 23, verse 34, is now universally regarded as a fabrication to the text of the Gospel of Luke. Uh, that, uh, I mean, Isa alayhi salam, according to the dominant opinion of our ulama, was, um, was nowhere near a cross to begin with. The Christians believe that he was crucified um, for various reasons. Um, although even in earliest Christianity there was a difference of opinion, and this is historically documented, uh, but um, in, in Luke's gospel, that statement that Father forgive them for they know not what they do is now universally accepted by New Testament textual critics as being a later fabrication to the text of, of the gospel of Luke. <clears throat> It is related that Omar said to him, my mother, and another thing is, even if even if Christians want to say, no, it's authentic, and he forgave them while he was being killed by them, well, that shows a strong type of character from, from Isa alayhi um, salam. But compare that to the, the conquest of Mecca, and he's going to get into that, actually, when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam is in a position of power to punish them, uh, and he forgives them in the position of power. He doesn't forgive them while he's powerless, while he's being killed, right? I mean, that's also uh, a, a demonstration of magnanimous character. Don't get me wrong, of course it is. But imagine being in a position of power over your enemies and forgiving them. Um, it's just um, a, a more exalted or higher level of magnanimity, I think. It is related from that Omar said to him, said to the Prophet وسلم, My mother and father be your ransom, O Messenger of Allah. Nuh salam invoked a curse against his people when he said, uh, My Lord, do not leave even one of the rejectors upon the earth. <clears throat> Had you invoked a curse like that against us, we would have been destroyed to the last man, he says. Your back had been trodden on, your face had been bloodied, and your tooth has been broken, and yet you have refused to utter anything but good. You have said, Oh Allah, forgive my people, for they don't know. So there's a different version of the same statement of the Prophet Wasallam that he either said, Allahum mahdi qawmi, or Allahum idhfir li qawmi. Uh, oh Allah, guide my people, or Allah, forgive my people, <clears throat> for they don't know. <clears throat> So I remember one time years ago, and I'll end with this story. Years and years ago, we had a halakha in the masjid on Friday nights, and there was a Christian brother who visited us. We had Christian brothers in, uh, come uh, um, uh, once in a while. You know, one of the one of the brothers, the Muslim brothers in the MSA. You know, he some Christian guy would come, and he would invite him to the halakha. Anyway, so there's a Christian brother at the halakha. And he was there, and he was asking some, um, some you know, uh, difficult type questions. And but he was very respectful. Um, you know, he was he uh, was uh, uh, he was trying not trying to disrespect us at all. He was trying to get real clarification on issues. Most of the issues were theological things, um, and so 
uh, I remember in the, in the course of the discussion, um, a man came into the masjid and he listened for about two minutes and then he said, you know, these, these kafar, you know, they, uh, their hearts are sealed and their ears are deaf and their eyes are blind and this type of thing. And the, and the brother, the Christian brother, he was, he was, he was like, well, who is he talking about? Is he talking about me? And so we had to reassure the brother that, you know, he's, uh, his, that's his opinion. And we don't share that, that opinion. I mean, he was there for a few minutes and this was this man's judgment about this, this Christian guy. I mean, he had basically, you know, his, his threshold of helm was five, 10 minutes. And when you compare that to the Prophet Sallallahu who's dealing with mushrikeen who are trying to kill him actively for 20 years and he doesn't give up on them. Right. Um, and Adi Ayyad, he actually, uh, relates the story of, uh, Abu Sufyan, whom the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, continued to address with respect, um, after 20 years of fighting and eventually Abu Sufyan became Muslim. And then the Prophet recognized his chieftaincy in Mecca and said, man dakhla, man dakhla beta Abi Sufyan faqad amin. Whoever enters the house of Abu Sufyan is safe. He had this announced during the conquest of Mecca. <clears throat> so that's the difference between our threshold, our limit of hilm or forbearance. You know, again, forbearance is, is being able to be dignified in the face of provocation. And the Prophet Sallallahu forbearance, when you have mushrikeen actively trying to kill him, uh, and have killed his companions and members of his bait, Ahlul Bayt, um, and he continues uh, to uh, show them respect and, and dignity, and they become Muslim eventually. So we can take a lesson uh, from that, obviously. So I think at this point, uh, we'll end the class. So we got about halfway through section 12 here. So we'll continue with this section, inshallah ta'ala, next week. <clears throat> Thank you for joining us. Uh, and we'll see you next time, inshallah ta'ala. Um, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.